What are you talking about? Everybody's touching you. Uh, but after that, he said, I perceive that virtue hath gone out of me. Do you realize? She partook. She took part of his virtue. And that's a good picture for you and I. If we want to partake of his divine nature, it's right there for the grandma. I can grab a hunk and Brother Dave here can and Pastor Kim and all you guys, and he'll just regenerate more and more. I don't know how he does that, but it's it's there for the taking. Amen. If you yield to that sanctification process, we can partake of his divine nature. Mm -hmm. Faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. And charity never fail. And you say, okay, that was great for her because she could actually reach out and touch it. And so can you. Amen. Right here, whenever you want. You can touch him through that book. God's divine words, they're powerful. They're convicting, they're correcting, they're cleansing. They're also very comforting. And the comfort of them is all about those precious promises. We mentioned some of them in the morning message, but how about Romans 8.38? It says, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. Ten things. None of those things can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, he's covered all the bases. If you're in Christ, you can't get out of Christ. That's pretty comforting. That's pretty comforting if you've got a, maybe a, a son or a parent or a friend that has totally backslid. Mm -hmm. and, and to the point where you're not even sure if they're saved. Right. But if they got saved, they're saved. Right. The thing is, God will allow you to backslide as far as you can go. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you're going to be naked and ashamed in right. the judgment seat of Christ. That's going to be pretty sad. Mm -hmm. Pretty sad for anyone in this room that maybe is trying to do things to please the Lord. So I hope you understand the sanctification process and, and just yield to it cooperate with it. Let him shape you and mold you, however he wants to. Mm -hmm. And when we finish this message, you can come up here and do whatever you want to this clay, because this is willing to be shaped. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we need to be. Just yield it. You know, I took life-saving classes when I was in high school, and they teach you how to save a drowning person. And uh, you know the biggest danger in trying to save someone that's drowning is them clobbering you over the head. Because they're just out there flailing in the water, and they'll, they'll punch you, knock you out, and you'll drop. If they would just yield, they get saved just like that. Same with us. You need to just yield. Let go. Let go and let God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit about the rapture. The fact that, you know, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the verse I didn't read to you was the very end of uh, chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians. It says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. These words are comforting. And if you want to comfort a lost person or even you know, a saved person, explain the rapture to him. The fact that we don't have to suffer through the tribulation. It's very comforting. Right. Thank you, Lord. Now, if you really want to comfort him, use those exact words. Show him the scripture. Because there's power in the words. That's why he says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Uh, this is a little off the track, but I just want you to turn to Proverbs 22. Something I like to cover in the morning thing. I'm going to take a liberty to, to show you this before we finish. I, you know, and I only say this because maybe it's just me. I'm real slow. Uh, I, I was at least in my second year of Bible school before I realized the importance and the power of God's words. I really, you know, it just didn't dawn on me, even though they kind of pounded into you there. I mean, he's always talking about the W-O-R-G-S. You know, Brockman's always doing that. I just, I still didn't dawn on me. It's those words. They're pure. They're important. Every letter, every jot, every tittle, you know, every part of the word is important. There's that book by a pastor, I think it's got uh, In All of Thy Word by Gail Whitlinger. Mm -hmm. She tells you about five or six things. I would have never guessed her in that Bible. And she's probably only scratched the surface. I highly recommend that book for anyone because it will increase your faith, you're going to realize these, these words are more supernatural than you have in The very letters have meaning. The shape your mouth makes to, to say the letter has significance. Mm -hmm. it, it's just, 
it's just it's crazy. There's a science called computational linguistics. They put every word of King James Bible in the computer, punch the button, and you know what, what came out? A mathematically predictable rhythm and meter from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22. Mm -hmm. They call it the heartbeat of God. Mm. That's what it is. It's mathematically predictable. No other book written by one man, short or long, has that rhythm and prose and meter where you can actually predict which the next thing is going to be. You know that there were words in the King James Bible? Oftentimes the translators could choose between the word to or into, and it wouldn't matter which way they went. But supernaturally, guided by the Holy Spirit, there were times when they needed a two-syllable word instead of a one-syllable right. to keep that heartbeat going. And that's what they did. No oh, man. Right. Look at Proverbs 22, verse 20. Have not I written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge that I may make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. God is going to be sending people across your path. He's going to be giving you opportunities to bring him pleasure. And the best way you can do that is answer those people with these words. Yeah. Explaining the rapture is a good thing. Mm -hmm. If you can quote the verses, if you can show them the verses, better. Right. I, got a, I got a magnet on my car that says, King James Bible, God's perfect word. I almost didn't buy that. Because why? It's not scripture. It's good. And I got other scripture on there, so I don't feel too bad about it. But you know, there's something powerful about those words. And they're comforting. Now look at it. I said they're convicting, they're correcting. They're cleansing, they're comforting. I could also talk about the fact that they're critiquing, they're confirming. They clothe us, they conquer us, they confound us. And sometimes, hopefully, they control us. Now, that's ten aspects of the words of God, all beginning with the letter C. This book is so amazing, so powerful, that you could take the other 25 letters of the alphabet and, on average, come up with at least ten aspects. That's how special it is. It's amazing. Well, enough about that. What about the teapot? Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. This is my five-minute message. Ephesians 4. Paul's talking about unity here. Ready for the church of Ephesus? And he says in verse 1 of Ephesians 4, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Does anyone here have a word other than vocation in their Bible? Anybody? Raise your hand. Okay. I keep asking because for some reason I think people have the word vacation. <laughs> I haven't found it yet. I know it's one of those versions. We are not called to a, voca a vacation. Eat, drink, and be merry. You know, I'm going to be in heaven one day. Which is great. But man, there's a little thing called the judgment seat of Christ in between that and the Lord. Look at it. How do you know, we talked about the word marred and how you go to the law first mentioned or other places in the Bible. This word vocation is only mentioned one time in the Bible. So what do you do? Well, look at the rest of the verse. Wherewith ye are called. That's what a vocation is. It's your calling. And in God's eyes, your vocation, your calling, is much more important than your occupation. Right. Now, we need occupations. Right. We need to support our families. Uh -huh. We need to feed ourselves, take care of our loved ones. And if the Lord blesses you more abundantly than you need, guess what? He did that for a reason. Now, reason is that you can share your excess with your church, your friends, family, others that are in need. Don't be like me for 30 years, showered myself with that abundance. Right? That's not good. That doesn't please God. That displeases God. He goes on in verse 2, with the lowliness and meekness we're supposed to uh, serve, uh, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Then in verse 8, he says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. I would encourage you on your own to read this section of verses. I'm not going to try to convince you about this next statement. Because in verse 11, it says, He gave some apostles, 
some prophets 